Well, that certainly looks like it's going to be a fun event for all of you ladies. I'd encourage you, if you want more information on that, uh, shoot my wife a text message or an email. She'd be glad to get in touch with you or uh, talk to her next Sunday. You do have a little bit over a month, actually about a month and a half before uh, that event will take place. But the sooner you can get signed up, the better. So, uh, yeah, we really look forward to that. Well, today we are in week number two of our series going through the book of Joshua. And uh, as we're going through the book of Joshua, uh, we are kind of looking at it from this perspective. Joshua, uh, as far as an individual, and then also the book, it, it kind of relates how Joshua went from being a rejected spy to a victorious leader. And if you remember last week, whenever we were together, we looked at Joshua chapter number one. And if you have your Bibles there at home, I'd encourage you get your Bibles out, open them up to the sixth book of the Bible. That's going to be Joshua. And we're going to be in Joshua chapter number one today. Uh, if you're using a, a phone, you can use that as well. If you don't have a Bible and you're at home next week, whenever you come back to North Winds, grab a Bible off the shelf. We'd love to give you one so that you can have one for yourself. Joshua chapter number one, we were there last week and we read just these two verses in Joshua one. Then we went back and we did quite a bit of history, but we read this after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. And if you remember, we then went back and we looked at how uh, God had delivered the children of Israel. We actually went all the way back to see how they got into Egypt. And then we went and we looked at how God brought them out of Egypt. And then we saw that he brought them all the way up to the promised land. They sent in the 12 spies. Uh, the 10 spies came back and they said to the people, we just can't do this. But then there was Joshua and Caleb. And you remember what Caleb said in Numbers chapter number 13 in verse number 30. It says, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. And then we have this three letter word, but. But the men who had come up with him said, and these would have been the 10 other spies, they said this, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And you'll remember that we wrapped up by looking at this and asking this question, do you see the size of the obstacle or do you see the size of your God? Do you see the size of the obstacle? Remember the, the 10 spies that came back? They said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Everyone's huge. We can't possibly fight against them. But they forgot that they had God on their side. And so you remember an entire generation had to die off there in the wilderness. And so as we begin the book of Joshua, they're right up there next to the promised land again. The generation has died off. Moses has died. And now they are allowed to go in. And we read this. and We already read it before that it's time to go in. And he says, listen, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. And we continue on today. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And in the last verse for today, verse number eight, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Lord, I pray that as we study your word today, you would see fit to teach us, align our hearts and our minds with you. May we learn what you would have for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so 
With the students uh, on Sunday nights, we have been encouraging them to do daily devotions, time with God in His Word. And to help them with this, we gave each of the students a 52-week devotional. And uh, as the, the devotional that we gave them, it's called Seven Arrows. It's by Matt and Sarah Rogers. And uh, basically what they're trying to do is help the students learn how to read something in the Bible and then properly understand and apply it. And I'm going to try to teach just some of that to you today. Uh, so, so hang in there. This can be very valuable for you going forward. And, and so I'm just going to do five of the seven arrows uh, if I start with arrow number one, it's almost like it's a repeat sign. And basically what it's asking you to do is to summarize what you just read. So you read something, you get to the end of it, and you're able to say, okay, here's what that basically said. If you get to the end and you can't do that, you've got to read it again. The second thing, the second arrow is an arrow that points to the left or backwards, you might say. And, and the question here is, what did it mean to the original audience? And so each of the books had an original audience. So, for instance, the book of Joshua would have been written so that the Israelites could read it. And those generations that came after the generation that went into the promised land, they would be able to look back and say, wow, I see what God did back then. And so the original audience that it was written to uh, would have been the Israelites. And what did it mean to them? Well, the arrow pointing up is, well, what can we learn about God from this passage? And uh, obviously, with it being God's word, we want to be able to say, okay, what do we learn about God from what we just read? Uh, the, the arrow pointing down, you might think, oh, that must be talking about what do we learn about Satan? But it's really just pointing back down to the earth. Uh, we've pointed up to God, and now we're pointing back down to man. And what do we learn about mankind from what we just read? The fifth arrow, and this will be the last one that I point out and that we walk through this morning. The fifth arrow is an arrow that points to the right or points forward. And the question becomes, okay, well, what should we do or what should I do as a result of what I've just read? What does this passage demand of me? What is it asking me to do? How can I apply this in my own life is basically what it is asking us to do. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the verses that we read today and we're going to answer these questions. So the first question was the repeat arrow. And the question is, okay, well, what's the summary of this passage? Well, we just read it together, and hopefully uh, in, in sitting in your homes, you're able to, to, to have your Bibles open, and you're able to look at that, and you're able to say, okay, I have a general idea of what I just read, and I've kind of summarized it here for you. Your summary might be a little bit different than my summary, and that's perfectly okay. Everybody, as they read a passage, might see a detail that's a little bit different to someone else's. You don't have to write everything that is in the passage, just a basic summary. And so here's how I've summarized it. God told Joshua that it's time to go in. He, he said, you know what, I'm going to be with you as you go, and uh, listen... It, as, as you go, I'm going to be with you, but you also need to obey the law that I have given to you, and then you'll be prosperous and successful. And so that's just a basic summary. Uh, as we think about the next arrow, and that's the arrow that points back or to the left, uh, this is, well, what did it mean to the original audience? And the first question you kind of need to ask is, who was the original audience? And in this passage, you might be able to find two original audiences. So, for instance, whenever it says that the Lord said to Joshua, well, in, in that statement, what God is saying, the original audience was Joshua. But as the book of Joshua is written, most likely by Joshua, as the book of Joshua is written, it's not intended as far as the original audience to be Joshua himself. So, so what God said, the original audience of that was Joshua. Well, what did it mean to him? And then what about the original audience of the book of Joshua? Who was that? Well, that was the, the future Israelite generations. And so we're going to look at both of them and, well, what did it mean to them? As you think about what it might have meant for Joshua, I think it had to have been encouraging to hear God reiterate his promises. And you see him say, be strong and very courageous, be strong and courageous, and I'm going to be with you, and wherever you set your foot, I'm going to give you that land. And it had to have been very encouraging to him to know, listen, God's going to be with me the way that he was with Moses. And he certainly saw the way that he had been with Moses, 
And I'm sure he wanted the same for himself. So this had to have been very encouraging to him. As we think about the Israelites as a whole, uh, this was obviously written for them in future generations. It meant that Joshua hadn't acted alone. So this wasn't Joshua in his conquest. And, and this is going to be an important thing as you read Scripture there are certainly Bible characters in Scripture, and it's neat to see how God uses them. But the central character of any story is never that individual. The central character is God and how he's using that individual. Whether it be a man, a woman, a child, whether it be an animal, the central character is not that. Even angels, the central character is not an angel. The central character is God. And so we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, for them, they had to have been very encouraged as they look back and they see, okay, well, it was God who said, I'm going to give you this land. And so it was God who then fulfilled his promise. And it was God who then went before them. And it was God who sustained Joshua. And so since even though Joshua is dead, you know what? God can sustain me. You know what? God can do that for me. God hasn't lost his power. And so for the original audience, for them to see, listen, this wasn't a conquest of Joshua, but rather it was the leadership of the Lord had to have been very encouraging to them. Well, just as a reminder of some of these arrows, we're going to look at the next two. What do we learn about God? Then what do we learn about mankind? As you think about this passage, and again, you can be looking at it in your Bibles. What do we learn about God? Well, God is faithful to keep his promises. Did you notice how he said, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. As I promised Moses, I'm going to fulfill with you. And so he's going to keep his promises. He's a God who values relationship. Think about it. God is speaking to Joshua. And God is encouraging Joshua. He's giving him that little bit of extra oomph to say, you know what? You can do this because I'm with you. And it, it's kind of neat, and I already said it, God's the central character, but God always chooses to use people, and he was going to use Joshua, and I think that shows us how much God, even all the way back then, how much he valued relationship, and also how much God values obedience, because he said, listen, if you will obey these commands, then you will be prosperous, then you will be successful. But you need to obey these commands. Don't turn to the right or to the left. You stay on this straight path of following me. So I think we learned these things about God. Well, what do we learn about mankind? And, and I think that the easiest and the quickest lesson to learn about mankind is this. We are under God's authority and control. Whenever we start thinking that we are the ones who set the course for our lives, whenever we start thinking that we are the ones who cause something to happen, when we start thinking that we are the ones who can do this or do that, and we forget that God is the central character, the central piece in our lives, every bit as much as he was in Joshua's, when we forget that, we're way out of whack. And so this, this passage here reminds us, as we look at how he led Joshua, that we are under God's authority and his direction. Well, the final one that we're going to look at this morning is this. What should we then do as a result of what we read? And I think it's very important that at this point we get it right. Because there's a lot of ways that we can look at this passage. And, and I'm going to use today as a, a bit of a teaching lesson. And uh, this is going to be important. And, and I know some of you like, uh, you like the high energy. You like the, the really challenging uh, points that say, okay, I've really got to do this. This is going to be a challenging point, but in a different way. This is going to be a let's make sure that when we read the Bible, we apply it correctly. Because we can read it, we can take it out of context... And we can come up with something that's totally wrong as we start to live it out. And so just by learning a few things, we're going to be able to see, okay, well, I think I can, I can now read a passage. I can understand the passage, and I can then apply it. And so as we get to this, well, what do we do? What does this passage demand of us? Uh, let's, let's take a look at a couple of things here. Joshua chapter number one, verse number three. Let's just say we pulled this out of context. And all we looked at was this. And we read these words. 
We don't maybe know who it's to. We just happen to know we're in the book of Joshua, okay? But we read this verse, and maybe somebody doesn't even quote it. Uh, maybe they just kind of put it on a plaque or something like that. You'll see that with Bible verses sometimes, right? Just one verse pulled out, put on a plaque. Okay, well, I'll just draw conclusions from that. Well, let's draw a conclusion from this. I will give you every place where you, where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Now, as you're at home, if you take this and you just pull it out, and you say, okay, that's for me. Everywhere I set my foot. God promised to give it to me. And there will be people that would try to say, okay, yes, this is what you should take out. But I think that we're smart enough to know, okay, that's... He was talking to Joshua. And he was saying, as you go into the promised land, I'm going to go before you. And every place you set your foot, I'm going to give you that, right? We know that this was, because we've already kind of set the, the context, we know that this was to Joshua. But if we misapply it and say, okay, well, God says everywhere I put my foot, in the same way that he promised Moses, he's going to give me that land. So I'm going to walk this land and, and, and claim the promise that God is going to give it to me. That, that This promise is not made directly to us. Well, verse number five, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. I can see pulling this one out and Handing it to your child that's being bullied at school and and you say listen God promises that no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life And and so you take that and you pull it out and you say, okay, wow, this is such an encouraging passage But the reality is again this This is said to joshua And he's about god's about to send him in to battle and he's about to say, you're going to face a lot of difficult things, but I'm going to go in front of you and nobody's going to be able to stand up to you, not because of who you are, but because of who I am. And I am promising that I will be with you. This is the first part of verse number five. The second part says this, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now you've heard this one a lot. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, as we Think about those principles that we learned earlier. What did this mean to the original audience? What did this mean to Joshua whenever it was spoken to him? Well, it obviously meant, you know, I'm going, I, God, am going to be with you as you go into the promised land. As you fight these battles, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to be with you the whole way through. Now the question then becomes, okay, we said not to pull the other ones out, but I feel like maybe I've heard that before, so is there something different about that? Well, actually you find this phrase repeated multiple times throughout Scripture, and you can actually, even if it's not repeated, you can go from one story of God working in a person's life to the next, and you can start all the way back with Adam and Eve. And even though they rebelled against God, God didn't leave them. He didn't forsake them. He made them those coats out of animal, animal skins, which means that he sacrificed for them. So start all the way back then, and you can go all the way through the New Testament, and you can see a pattern of God not leaving people alone. And so in Deuteronomy 31, verse number 6, we read this, and this is actually... Um, near the end of Moses' life, and Moses is talking to Joshua. And he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. Talking about the enemies. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So Moses had the experience of saying, he never left me. He didn't ever forsake me. You've been my understudy, so to speak. You've walked alongside. You've seen that God doesn't leave you. And I want to let you know that this promise is every bit as good for you as it has ever been for me. God's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Just a couple of verses later, uh, Moses repeats it again. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid do not be discouraged. A little bit later on in 1 Kings chapter number 8 and uh, in verse number 57, we read this. May the Lord our God, and by the way, this is Solomon who's speaking and he's uh, speaking at the dedication of the temple. And he says, may the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us. And so he has seen the pattern in the past. 
that God is a faithful God and he's not going to leave us. He's not going to abandon us. I think it's interesting uh, as sometimes people try to pull scripture out and, and, and misapply it. Uh, uh, you see actually as, as God, even as God is preparing to take the Israelites into captivity at times, he says, you know what? I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Pl plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You know he says that as he's taking them into captivity. As he's allowing them to be taken in. He says, listen, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Seventy years they were going to be in captivity. And yet he says, listen, I'm not going to abandon you even when you're there. And so we see this promise throughout scripture. We actually even get all the way up into the wonderful book of Hebrews. <laughs> I know all of you at home are just probably let out a little bit of a groan right there. It was, oh, we were in Hebrews for forever. Well, here we are again, and we're just being reminded of what we already studied in Hebrews 13, verse number five. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. This isn't just something that's randomly plucked out of Scripture. This is a repeating pattern. And so as we read this and we're able to compare it with Scripture, we're able to see, you know what? This is something that I need to hold on to for myself. If you look in verse number three, we're back in Joshua one again. And this is the first verse that I pulled out and said, you got to make sure not to misapply this. I'll give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. This is obviously a promise that was meant for Joshua, and it was a promise that was kept by God. So this isn't something that we claim for ourselves. What we can claim is God's faithfulness to keep his promises. What we can't claim by pulling it out and taking it out of context is that every place that we set our feet, God's going to give that to us. And so we just want to make sure we apply Scripture Correctly, uh, The second part, and we already said this just a moment ago, whenever we read that I'll never leave you and I'll not forsake you, once again, this is a promise that was made to Joshua and once again kept by God. It's also repeated multiple times throughout Scripture, and we're able to see that it's a pattern of what God does. It's, again, a pattern of his faithfulness. We saw his faithfulness earlier where it said... Every place you set your foot, I'll give that to you. And we're going to see that he keeps that promise. So God is faithful. We learn that from there. And again, we learn here, he's faithful. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. Well, we continue on to verse number seven. And this is where maybe we get some confusion. Uh, maybe It's probably not maybe. I know there's a lot of confusion about understanding not just this verse, not just verse number eight, but... Uh, an understanding of the law in general. And so when I'm talking about the law, I'm not talking about obeying the traffic uh, uh, laws. I'm not talking about um, following the orders of a policeman. I'm talking about the Old Testament law. And uh, so it says this in verse number seven. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Now, what you can learn from this, if you just pull this out and you think, okay, this applies right to me. Now, we've already seen that there are, there are things that as we read them, we have to be careful not to say, I claim that promise. Because in verse number three, everywhere you set your foot, I'll give that to you the same as I did with Moses. We know that that was a promise to Joshua. This is once again a promise to Joshua, right? Uh, this is the same context. This is the same passage. And he's saying, be strong and courageous and make sure you obey the law. And he says, if you do, you'll be successful wherever you go. And, and we could just pull this out and say, okay, all right. If I obey the law, I'll be successful. And uh, we could go to verse number eight and we have basically the same thing. Be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So if I obey the law, I'll be successful and I'll be prosperous. And so you find people a lot of times saying, you know what? I, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to obey the law because God has promised that if I obey the law, I will be successful. I will be prosperous. But who was this promise made to? This promise was made to Joshua. Now, what we want to do oftentimes is transfer that promise to us because depending upon how you grew up or how you were taught – 
It was kind of like this was the way that it was. I can remember growing up, and, and a lot of life was do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, right? And so we, we kind of think that that's the law. And if you remember, whenever Jesus came, who was he the most frustrated with? He seemed to be the most frustrated and the most against the Pharisees. What had the Pharisees done? They had made a law for everything. They had taken the original law and they had expanded upon it in so many different ways. But you would think, okay, well, this is going to make us more religious and this is going to make us even more successful and more prosperous. It would, it would logically follow that if we were, were going to say, okay, listen, follow the law and you'll be successful and you'll be prosperous. Well, let's do it to the greatest extent possible. But again, we want to figure out, okay, well, what was the meaning to the original audience? Does that have a direct application to me? In other words, can I just take that, say, okay, I do that. Therefore, I move forward in this direction. And I think we're going to find it's not exactly that way this time. But you say, well, in Hebrews 13, and we were just in verse number five, now we're in verse number eight. I remember reading that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, then he doesn't change. And if he doesn't change, then everything that he said before has a direct application to us now. And this is where I need to, to bring in something, and it's going to be a big word, and I don't want you to be turned off by it. Uh, it's a word called dispensationalism. And I just want to take a moment to explain what dispensationalism is. It's a system of theology which does these things. Now, when we're talking about a system of theology, it's basically a way that we help understand the Bible. And so um, you might have a system by which you accomplish certain tasks. You might have a system. I, I like to make pizza, and I have a certain system. Uh, some people do things a little bit different. Some people mix the water and the yeast and allow it to kind of mix together before they mix that with the flour. I have a certain system I like to use, a way I go about it. And that's what we're talking about with dispensationalism. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to make you a dispensationalist. I, I don't really care whether you are or whether you aren't. I do care about how you view the Bible and that you make sure that you view it correctly in its proper context for the right application. And so dispensationalism is simply this. It's a system of theology which uses a literal interpretation of Scripture. In other words, what it says is what it means. There's a primary application to it. So it uses a literal interpretation of Scripture. It, it draws a distinction between Israel and the church. So God made some very specific promises to the nation of Israel, and we believe that he will fulfill those promises. There are some that are still yet unfulfilled, and we believe that he will fulfill those promises to the nation of Israel. Uh, there are those who believe that the church replaces the nation of Israel. I was reading uh, not too long ago about uh, how uh, the covenant theologians would be what they're, they're called. It, that's neither here nor there. But um, how sometimes uh, those who have come to faith in Christ from the nation of Israel, uh, they kind of have a real, real big problem with them having faced all of the punishments that God said, if you do this, then this is what's going to happen. And so they endured the captivity and they endured the, the punishments and the corrections. But then the promises, they're saying, OK, so you're saying that we we as a nation, we had to deal with this. But you're telling us that the church displaces us as a nation and the church gets all the blessings. So, so we get all of the curses, we get all of the, the punishments, and you get all the blessings. They're like, it doesn't seem to fit. Like, and, and, it, and it doesn't. I, we believe, again, I believe in, in a literal interpretation of scripture, scripture. And whenever God makes a promise to Israel, I believe that he keeps that promise to Israel. And when he makes a promise to the church, I believe he keeps the promise to the church. So we see a distinction between Israel and the church. Uh, dispensationalism sees God as governing mankind in different ways throughout scripture now before you just turn me off and say god's the same yesterday today and forever he can't govern people different i want you to think for a moment some of you are probably parents maybe many of you are parents some of you have multiple children and i want you to think about this as you parent 
You're the same individual, but even within the same generational context. So we're talking about, you might have a child who's one year older than the other. You might have a child that's two, three, four years older than, than the other child. You as an individual are the same person, yet you govern them or lead them or parent them differently. By, by saying that God has led or governed people in different ways throughout history, it is not saying that God's character has changed. It is not saying that God's attributes have changed. It's just that the way that he has chosen to deal with people has changed. Does that make it, uh, uh, does that mean that he, he as, as, a, as God, has changed? Absolutely not. But we see that God is, in his governance of mankind, he certainly is governed in different ways throughout history. Uh, dispensationalism as a final thing, and, and listen, you can get really wrapped up into this. That's not my goal this morning. My goal is not to get really wrapped up in some system of theology. My goal is to be able to help you to properly understand and apply Scripture. And so the last thing, um, dispensationalism sees God as holding mankind responsible for what he has revealed to that point in time. Um, you read throughout the, the, the New Testament, you see this word found a lot, a mystery, mystery. Mystery. What is a mystery? A mystery is something that God has previously not revealed to mankind, but is then choosing to reveal about himself. And so we see this happen throughout Scripture, that God continues to reveal more and more and more about himself and about his plan. Again, not meaning that he has changed, but he allows us to get a better view of what he's doing, and he holds mankind responsible for what he has revealed. And so for us, who we live in the dispensation of grace, and I'll get to those dispensations in, in just a moment, we are held responsible for the gospel. The gospel is no longer a mystery. The gospel has been revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the good news. He did go to the cross to sacrifice for all mankind. And so we are held responsible for that. Well, let's just look here um, for a moment uh, and, and see an example. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them to be in relationship with him. I think we all would agree with that. God interacted with Adam and Eve completely differently than what he has interacted with mankind since. It says that he walked with uh, Adam and Eve in the, in the cool of the day. Uh, that, that had to have been a really cool and a really awesome thing. But he doesn't interact with mankind that way anymore. Their responsibility to God was different than ours. God gave them uh, the responsibility to, to rule over uh, the animals, and I believe that transfers onto us absolutely. But he also says to them, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, that's not, that's not something that transfers to us. That's not what we are held responsible for. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, uh, you remember that God then ended up protecting the Garden of Eden and not allowing them back in. And so we don't have to follow that command. That command has long since been passed. And so God deals with them or dealt with them in a different way, and he held them responsible for what they knew. And so that's just a, a short summary of dispensationalism. And basically what it allows us to do is to say this, okay, well, here is how God dealt with this group of people at that time. So for instance, here's what God held the Israelites responsible for, or here's what God held Adam and Eve responsible for, or here's what he holds us responsible for. And so it's just a way of looking at it to make sure that we don't mess up the promises and say, okay, everywhere I set my foot, God says he'll give it to me just like he did for Moses. Um, to make sure that we don't just say, okay, if we just obey the law, we'll be prosperous and successful. We want to make sure we understand it uh, properly. And so uh, there's going to be seven dispensations which are going to help to explain this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. The first in, uh, dispensation, you can, you can study this out. Uh, you're going to find some, some people online that just wholeheartedly disagree with dispensationalism. And, and that's okay. I'm not here to like try to get you to be a dispensationalist. I'm here to try to help you understand Scripture properly and make sure that you don't apply things which, which aren't meant for us. Uh, and, and then end up with a, a pretty warped view of God and how we're supposed to apply his scriptures. And so the first dispensation would have been with Adam and Eve before they sinned. 
That would have been what we would call the dispensation of innocence. The second one is what we would call conscience. Uh, and this would be from the first sin all the way to the time of the flood. The third one would be civil government, which is after the flood. The fourth one is promise. This is from Abraham. And remember, whenever God promised him, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. From Abraham to Moses. And then the law is given. And when the law is given, then they're held responsible for obeying that law from Moses to the cross. And you'll remember that Jesus came to fulfill the law completely. He was, he was able as the second Adam to fulfill the law completely. And then now we live in the dispensation of grace, which was from the time of the, Jesus on the cross and him accomplishing our redemption all the way up until the millennial kingdom. We live under this. And then finally, we would see the final dispensation as the dispensation that's going to take place in the millennial kingdom where Christ is going to rule on the earth for a thousand years. Go back to Joshua 1.7 real quick, and, and here's why I needed a, for us to be able to have a general understanding of this, and hopefully you didn't get lost in all the details. But as we read this, and it says, listen, be very careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And then verse number 8, same thing. You'll be prosperous and successful if you obey the law. So if we just draw and say, okay, well, that's what the Bible says, that's what I got to do. Now, when you do that, or when anybody does that, I want you to understand what you're doing. You're actually, for most people, you're picking and choosing even when you're saying you're going to obey the law. Because usually what, what people today would say is obeying the law is, hey, as long as I follow the Ten Commandments. Now, that's not what's being said to Joshua. The law involved a sacrificial system. The law involved very specific punishments uh, for very specific sins. The law involved uh, not blending certain types of, uh, of, of materials. The law involved a lot more than just being able to say, okay, well, those are the Ten Commandments. And so we have the tendency in our American culture to kind of see this and say, listen, just obey the Ten Commandments and you'll be pr prosperous and successful because that's what God's word says. God's word said to, or God specifically said, and it was recorded in his word. Listen, Joshua, as you go in, I'm, I'm saying I'm going to be with you. You obey that law, though. I've given you the law for your own good. And if you obey it, you will be prosperous and successful. But that doesn't have a direct transference to us because it was under the dispensation of law that Joshua would have been living. And we know by now that we are living under the dispensation of grace. And so this obey the law and then you'll be successful, that's not directly applicable to us. Now, before you get upset and say, oh, man, Pastor Dave is one of those that just wants to throw away the Old Testament. <laughs> There's a reason we're studying Joshua. Uh, God's entire word has value for us. Okay, so I'm not saying throw away the Old Testament at all. We are learning from it, but we are learning from it the proper application. And so, so let's take a look at this. We're, we're saying this does not have a direct application, but we live under grace. And the same general principle is going to be transferred to us. And let's just see how that happens. Let's look in your Bibles. If you have your Bibles again with you, 1 John chapter number 2. So you're almost to the end of your Bible, 1 John chapter number two and as you get the first john chapter number two two we're going to start in verse number one and it says my dear children i write this to you so that you will not sin so before you think well pastor dave is trying to get rid of the law he's trying to throw out the ten commandments before you think that's what's happening here i'm just simply trying to help us understand god's word in its proper context because we want to apply it accurately so we read here in first john 2 1 listen i'm going to write this to you so that you will not sin so there's still a high level of accountability but if anybody does sin we have one who speaks to the father in our defense that's jesus christ the righteous one he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours but also for the sins of the whole world it continues on in verse number three we know that we have come to know him talking about jesus look if we obey his commands the man who says i know him 
but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. So you're starting to see a pretty similar thing as what was spoken back in, in Joshua's day and what was spoken to him. It goes on to say, but if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So back in the book of Joshua, you remember we read God expected obedience to the law. And if you obey the law, then you'll be prosperous and successful, he says to Joshua. The lesson for us is still that God expects obedience, but the obedience is to not the law. The obedience is to his son, Jesus Christ. You know, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus starts his public ministry and he gives the Sermon on the Mount. And as he gives the Sermon on the Mount, that's just what we call it. Um, do you realize that when he gives it, he actually raises the bar in every one of the commands that he gives? He raises the bar. He doesn't lower it. Some people are afraid to say, you know what, the Old Testament law isn't directly applicable to us. Some people are afraid to say it. Now, the reality is, is that you're not following the Old Testament law, regardless of whether you think you should or not. I don't know of a single person who still offers sacrifices. Uh, there's a reason we don't offer sacrifices, because Jesus has sacrificed himself once for all, right? Yeah, and so that part of the Old Testament law we acknowledge is definitely not still applicable. Circumcision, part of the Old Testament law. You can look in Galatians. You can look in the book of Acts. They actually have a Jerusalem council uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the Jews are thinking, listen, those Gentiles that are coming to faith in Christ, in order for them to really be part of the family, they need to be circumcised. And you, you can find this Jerusalem council. I believe it's Acts chapter number 10. And as you look at this Jerusalem council taking place, whenever they come out of that, they say, you know what? No, you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to follow the Old Testament law. And so there is clearly a difference between living in what we would call the dispensation of grace and the dispensation of law. So the lesson for us, and, and it doesn't lower the standard, it raises it, is to be obedient to his son, Jesus Christ. And so here's your homework as we wrap up this morning. Your homework is this. What does it look like instead of just... I actually think in saying I need to be obedient to the law, I actually think that we lower the standard rather than raising the standard. I think whenever we just kind of put it to a list of, well, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, when we do that, we kind of have a list and we say, okay, kind of like uh, the man who wanted to justify himself, the rich young ruler, I, hey, I've kept the law. But Jesus raises the bar, and so my challenge to you this morning is to consider this. What does it look like to be obedient to Jesus? It just might mean that your attitude has to fall in line every bit as much as your actions. It just might mean that you have to love someone who is very unlovable. It just might mean that it's a radical transformation to everything you've thought before. Well, I just, I won't do this and I won't do this. And Jesus says, but I have so much more. So the, the homework is this. What does it look like to be obedient to God's son? Father, thank you so much for the day that you have given to us. Cold outside, yes. But I trust that for all of us, it's been good to be together uh, in a different format, obviously. But around your word, I pray that you continue to teach us. I pray that uh, for those who may may kind of be pushing a little bit against this and saying, I just don't know. I think that I think we just need to take verse 7 and verse 8 of Joshua 1 and say, listen, obey the law and you'll be prosperous. Obey the law and you'll be successful. I pray that you would help them to come to an understanding and a clear realization of how you have chosen to, to govern and to hold mankind responsible to to what you have revealed to them. And you've revealed to us your son. And we are so thankful for it. We are so thankful for him. God, I pray that you help us to walk in obedience to him. In Jesus' name.
Again, I thank you so much for uh, joining with us this morning and trust that you have a safe and a warm day with your family. I think that this should already be understood. There is no youth today. Uh, there is no life group today. Um, stay home, be safe, be warm, and uh, God bless you all.